Hello all, and thank you for joining CPOW's webinar series, Winning Strategies for Staffing Businesses at Critical Times. For today's webinar, Effective Styles and Strategies During COVID-19, CPAL is joined by an all-woman panel to discuss what kind of leadership tactics are successful during these uncertain times. Of our 600 plus registrants, we have 62% women attendees and 38% male attendees. So welcome everybody. So before we launch into today's webinar, there are just a few housekeeping items I want to cover. First, each webinar will be recorded and available on demand through CPAL's website. A follow-up email will be sent to all registrants with the webinar recording and any other relevant material. Second, we will have a Q&A session following this presentation. All participants have entered the webinar muted, so please enter your questions in the chat box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. And finally, we just have two polling questions we would love to launch before we begin. I'll run these questions now, so please let us know your thoughts, please do vote, and then we'll begin the presentation. So, our first question today is, which of the below changes will become mainstream industry practices even in the post-pandemic era? So I'll give you guys just about 60 seconds to vote. Please do tell us what you think and then we'll share our results. Okay, about 10 more seconds, everyone. Okay, great. So for practices we think are going to become mainstream, 69% of us think work from home and a very, very distant second of 15% think that online interviews are going to become mainstream. So that's great. Um, we have one more question. Which of the below things should be a priority for staffing companies as part of learning from this crisis? So again, I'll give you guys about 60 seconds to vote. Please do cast your votes and then we'll let you know what you think. Okay, great, about 10 more seconds, everyone. Okay, so Today, we thought that building strong client and candidate relationships would be the number one priority at learning from this crisis, and embracing technology to replace mundane human interactions is going to be a close second. So that's great, thank you everyone. Um, okay, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today. Um, we'll start with Heitel Parikh. Um, Heitel is the co-founder and president of Rangam, a high-performing, diverse supplier of enterprise-wide staffing, consulting, payroll, and onboarding services. She leads the organization, develops processes, and builds relationships with diverse business leaders to expand Rangam's business in the U.S. and abroad. So welcome. Our second panelist today is Don Burke. Dawn is an HR and leadership consultant, speaker, and writer specializing in modern HR practices, recruiting, and workplace culture. As a senior consultant with Recruiting Toolbox and founder of Dawn Burke HR, she helps companies create hiring cultures that connect, that connect with candidates while creating company cultures that connect with employees. Our third panelist today is Divya Pant. Divya is the director of HR at CPAL. As director, she leads all aspects of human resources, including talent acquisition, talent development, employee engagement, and employee communication at CPAL. She has more than nine years of experience in human resources with companies like Deutsche Bank and Accenture. And finally, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, CPAL's very own CEO, Samir Panakalapati. Samir started out with a passion to build technology products for small and medium scaled businesses. With time, that passion turned into a driving force to create products that had the potential to disrupt the conventional market trends as an investor. So at CPAL, we'd like to welcome our all women panel. We're excited to hear from such industry experts. And with that, Samir, I'll pass it off to you. Good morning. Thanks everyone joining the, um, the, the great panel. Um, I think the first time we have a 62% woman participants. 
and looking forward to, uh, I mean, I know all of my, including myself, and I, in fact, I asked my wife to join the call, so maybe she'd be around <laughs> in it. So it, it's great to hear uh, your experiences and insights. Uh, it would be a, uh, it's an awesome opportunity. Um, uh, just a quick, um, I have about five to six questions. Um, we'd like to keep up 60 to 90 seconds, one to one and a half minute answer. Um, so that we can able to circulate many questions. Also, uh, last time we were, we kind of ran out on uh, the participants' questions. I know I would like to address at least a couple of them. Um, and quite often we distribute later uh, if we have more than a couple. Uh, but I'm going to start with um, the, my first question. I think it's just um, kind of a generic in your experience. Uh, I, I, the way I go with it, I go with the Donna. And then Jivya, and then go to Hital. So just to rotate that um, uh, cycle. Uh, my first question is Don, Donna. You know your experience. How is COVID-19 changing today's workforce? How many of these changes will become permanent? Well, COVID has been what a lot of people have coined a black swan event, an event that nobody saw coming. Nobody even. It was almost a failure to imagine that this sort of event would happen to anybody, let alone something globally. Um, so when I've talked with clients, when I've talked to my HR peers, when I've talked to engagement strategists, I think the first thing that it's doing to employees is it's definitely putting into their, their, their thoughtful consciousness uh, the possibilities that safety can be compromised at work. Um, and we're not talking necessarily about, hey, let's be sure you don't slip and fall where somebody just mopped the floor. No, we're talking about um, life and death safety issues across a wide expanse of organizations. So it's the first time I think ever where employees really are flipping the switch on, how are my companies taking care of me? How are companies, um, are they listening to me? Are they taking seriously my concerns, not only for my fellow workers, but for myself and my family. Um, I think they're also now, employees are much more in tune with seeing how their companies are reacting to this type of a crisis with their customers, their communications. Um, and, and if companies are not being transparent, are not seeming to err on the side of humane practices, uh, treatments, uh, having types of things where they're transparent with uh, the different things they're doing or experiencing. I think it is starting to become top of mind for employees to say, there's got to be a better way for me to spend my days uh, than organizations that aren't seeming to get it or understand or want to help me thrive as well as me help the company thrive. Um, I think it's just an awareness right now. Um, and I'll let the other two chime in on, there's so many, I mean, there's 17 things that I can list, but I think it's just an awareness right now is the big change you're going to see with employees. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's almost going to be a pre-COVID era, post-COVID era situation in, mm -hmm. in awareness. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Way, I'm going to, to look at, you know, ask the same question about um, how mm -hmm. the COVID-19 changed the today's workforce and, you know, how, how what are these changes do you see is going to be like a long-term problem? Right. So, uh, you know, in my opinion, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on the way organizations work. Um, employees have now become uh, more tech savvy, uh, more flexible, and um, they can now operate with uh, you know almost minimal or no supervision so um yeah technology has been a major lifesaver during this time also you know video conferencing e-learning e-onboarding and uh, you know various of the tools have made work from home a real success so technology is obviously there to stay um in fact we can expect crazy innovation in this field um Another significant change um, would be in, uh, you know, people's attitude. Uh, people will be more receptive towards change now. They will be more collaborative and um, leaders will become more empathetic. So, um, yeah, uh, we can expect a better and a more resilient workforce in future. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. I, that, that's very true. That's very true. And um, who would have thought uh, uh, Zoom? Um, the violation be four times of all the other, um, uh, you, you know, the um, uh, the automakers measures combined. 
it, it's a crazy times, but technology is going to stay. Um, Hitel, I'm going, coming back to you. I'm going to uh, ask the question, you know, how is COVID-19 is, is changing today's workforce? And in your perspective, what's going to change uh, long-term permanent? So I know the uh, two wonderful ladies touched upon uh, two things, which is safety and technology, uh, which is definitely on top of everybody's mind. Safety is on everyone's mind. Technology really helps enable us to be productive. Uh, and what COVID has really taught us is to be resilient, uh, thinking outside the box, being innovative, doing things that we normally wouldn't even think about uh, before or even hesitate. However, it's really forced us because of the circumstances that we're faced with and all the different uncertainties that we are continuously being faced with each and every week as we uh, walk through the journey in the past couple of months. Uh, I would I would actually add to this is that all of us in the community, um, in addition to being um, more empathetic, because leaders have to be a lot more empathetic now today than ever before, uh, being flexible, being nimble, uh, that is uh, some of the uh, key things that we have seen in the industry, especially when many of us, especially the women that are on the call today but can probably resonate to this, right? That when you're working from home, now you're really not just working, you've got multiple hats to play. You're a parent at home, you're a teacher at home, and you're trying to juggle with all of those activities and at the same time, um, really balancing that act, that balancing act of work life has, has definitely given a new meaning uh, through uh, COVID-19. And there's also some silver lining to this, right? We always talked about the new way of world of work. What was that about in the past, pre-COVID? Try to bring your true authentic self to work. Well, guess what? COVID has really helped us to bring our true authentic self to work. We're more, um, I would say, uh, tolerance in a lot of the noises, the frictions that we sometimes hear on the Zoom calls, dropping off the calls. Um, having some background noises, kids passing by. So there are some silver linings uh, at the same time is how I like to look at things is to see how we can grow and learn from some of these experiences. And some of the um, learnings will be here to stay uh, post COVID-19. Uh, some of the activities uh, will, uh, will continue uh, and it'll all depend on individuals and, and, and the circumstances. And some, we may go back to the old ways. So when I asked my team members, um, they loved at the beginning, uh, wow, we're gonna be able to get, you know, work from home, this is fantastic, 100%. Now, if you ask them, they're dying to get back to the office. So that, these are some of the things that we're experiencing. Thanks, Ethel. And we get the same sentiment. In fact, I was just, uh reading a poll uh, done by Glassdoor yesterday, there are about 69% women are waiting to get back to work. Uh, about 72% of the men are waiting to get back to work. So, I mean, you definitely resonate at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm switching our guests a little bit um, to as we talk about, um, you know, the perspective of the employees, their safety, the technology and, and, and different things. And I think we do all of that stuff really to drive. How do we engage, especially when 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 we? I think we're all seeing that uh, more often. I think we will have a remote workforce than we have seen a pre-COVID situation scenario. So uh, to address that in an increasingly global workforce, work, remote workforce, right? Employee engagement is more than ever because you know our interactions may not be direct uh, um, uh, personal, but you know, through uh, calls. What strategies are you implementing to foster successful employee engagement? And I will start with Don. Sure. Uh, well, employee engagement. One of the things that I find fascinating when people talk about employee engagement is they try to complicate it. Um, I always think when it comes to employee engagement, don't overthink it make it simple, make it accessible. So what do I mean by that? Um, regardless, I think pre-COVID or post-COVID, the best strategy to engage team members, period, point blank, is through creating a better system for leaders to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with employees, whether it's the team lead to the employee, the CEO to the group, 
um, creating a culture where having these types of interactions become the norm, um, where conversations are not just about status updates on work, which are important, but it really is about how are you doing? How can I help you? Where are you strong? How do we leverage that? Are you feeling safe? Are you secure? How can you help me? And, and I'm gonna kick it up even a bigger notch. There are some companies pre-COVID that began doing this, these sorts of things regularly because I think everybody on the panel would agree. The concept of creating engaging workforces really started to take shape with the, when the millennials came on board. All right, we already know that creating an engagement workspace wasn't just a nice to have, it was something that you have to do for great results and because it's the best thing to do, it's a better way to work. Again, let's not overthink it. Why wouldn't you wanna to talk to your people and make sure that they feel good and okay and they can produce results? Because we know that those sorts of practices are better for the company's revenue, all right? Um, but, uh, so, so none of this is new, but here I think where it's gonna like be kicked up another notch. And companies who were not, um, let me rewind. What does that mean? All of that means that the strategy has to be, before you're starting to talk about training on a variety of tactical things, every leader needs to, when they first become a leader in your organization, needs to learn how to build trust. A lot of the times when leaders start an organization or if somebody's promoted within an organization to lead, most of them have never actually been taught how to lead. And right now we know with engagement, the biggest thing that a leader can do is provide that empathy and all the programs that are gonna help create a relationship of trust. Because when they trust you, and that doesn't mean you're a pushover, it doesn't mean that you don't demand results, but it does mean that you are creating an environment where an employee is gonna to want to come to you to give feedback, is gonna to wanna to come to you for mentorship, is gonna to wanna to come to you, as opposed to you pushing yourself on the people to drive results. Now, I, I'll say one more thing and I'm gonna pass it off. I think the thing that's gonna be interesting post COVID, and first of all, I don't know if there is a post COVID. You know, we all talk about what's the new normal. We don't know. Sometimes we're like, oh, let's not say new normal. It's like, what's the next normal gonna be, right? I mean, who knows? We don't even know what's happening yet, right? We're still in the middle of it. Um, but I think organizations who pre-COVID were not already starting to have engagement programs and, and start to train their leaders how trust building and empathy and connection is really the best way to drive results, they're gonna be behind the curve right now because it is going to be more difficult in a time where people are feeling out of control. Um, and I, I, and I, I wanna hear y'all's thoughts on this because I, am, I know there's gonna be some incredible change in the way people work after this after, during, how we're, whatever we're morphing through with COVID. But I'm, I'm, I'm still, I still think that once things start to even out a little bit, I think that there's gonna be a lot of leaders who are driven by high dollars and money and goals and stress will retreat back to the way it was. So I don't necessarily think that engagement post COVID is gonna be driven necessarily by leadership. I think it's going to still demand a push from the employee base, from the customer base, um, for the, the real long-term change to happen. Um, and hey, I'm pro-leader. It's not that they don't want to do it. I just think they're going to retreat back to what they're used to. It's a great uh, perspective, Donna, especially we're talking about the trust and empathy between not just not the one side of it is, you know, from the leaders to the employees, but from the employees back into the leaders too. It's a two-way stream and i you know I, I we totally agree with that it's a great perspective thank you for sharing that and um uh, divya I come back to you um i know you have a um a well run uh, hr organization um uh, across the globally so what have you seen uh the pre and post covid employee engagement practices and and in uh, your insights uh, so I so much agree with Dawn when she says that, you know, employee engagement uh, is, you know, all about communicating with their employees. So that has not changed. It was there pre-COVID, it is there now. Um, so um, also um, it is about, you know, understanding people's aspirations, you know, providing opportunities in line with 
uh, their aspirations, um, you know, rejuvenating them, you know, providing learning opportunities. So at CPAL, obviously, we are in constant touch with our employees through one-on-one -on -one connects, webinars, etc. Uh, we try and keep them updated about, you know, the policy changes, if any, the upcoming activities, you know, the company goals and objectives and so on. Um, we also keep having regular fun activities for them, uh, especially uh, on Fridays, you know, just to raise their spirits and uh, increase uh, interactivity. Also, our you know L and D team made uh, good use of the uh, available time uh, in training and retraining our employees on the product, and also organized some uh, behavioral trainings. So that worked out uh, well for us. Yeah, Sabi. Thank, thank you, Deva. I mean, I, I, when I uh, sum up um, your conversation, you're talking about uh, keep the more employee communication more frequent, and the learning and development is also a big asset, uh, especially when you are dealing with employees. I think it's going to stay, uh, it's going to stay for for a post-COVID scenario too. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, uh, Hital, um, I know you run a great organization um, uh, across different countries and in different uh, market segments. Uh, so how, how do you see uh, the, the pre and the post COVID um, scenarios in terms of engaging employees, employees and improving the enga employee engagement? Um, have you seen, going to, uh, uh, going to at least see a, a significant change the way uh, the, some of the policies that you lay out for the business? And, and I would love to hear anything uh, uh, in that perspective. Sure, sure. So um, at Frank, our core philosophy is empathy drives innovation. And engagement, um, how we used to engage before and how we engage now has uh, definitely dramatically changed uh, due to technology. But there's been a different level of com uh, comfort that people are, have now stepped out of their comfort zone and craving more for that extra communication. So one of the things at Ranga what we do is uh, we emphasize on providing uh, communication, having platforms creating a structure and a format where people come together more and more and have discussions around certain activities, brainstorming, really providing their perspective on any areas. And what that really does, I feel that uh, usually in, uh, everyone is looking for ways where they can contribute. And if, if they're felt like they're being valued within the organization, you're going to see an increased level of engagement. Um, and at, at Rangam, that is pretty much um, during COVID, what we've actually done is really uh, created certain special focus group areas uh, uh, in certain specific areas of, le uh, let's say, functional uh, of our operation, whether if it's how do we engage better with our uh, business partners, uh, what do we do in terms of our technology innovation? So we're bringing different folks from different departments, different groups to come together and almost like do a design thinking process. And through that process, uh, there's some great ideas that come about uh, and they get all excited because now it's something that they brought forward to the organization and it's going to be really heard and listened to by the leadership team and by the management and some things might transpire some things may not transpire but during these periods of time i think that has really helped our organization to increase the level of engagement um, and as management we want to lead by examples right so we for amongst ourselves how we uh, communicate becomes critically important but with all of that keeping in mind that What's really required is to, uh, I think Zuya touched upon that, is having some fun activities. Uh, because now we can't meet in person, how can we uh, re um, create an environment where people can feel having some fun? So we've, we've played a lot of different games, engaged people on Zoom activities, um, through different platforms and formats as well. Uh, especially training and development. That's been one of the top biggest key within our organization during these tough times to encourage everyone to figure out ways because the roles that, are, that we have today may not be here tomorrow, may transform. There may be some roles that may become irrelevant. Some roles uh, may evolve. And if you instill within your organization the constant learning attitude, it really does help foster 
and cultivate that relationship between employee and employer. That's, that's, that's great. And thank you for sharing that. I know we hear a lot about the engagement and also the technology. Um, there are a lot of things going to um, uh, making a, um, a, you know, a significant play, play uh, in, in how businesses operate, right? And just so really uh, relevant to that, uh, uh, um, the mark, I, I would like to um, just briefly touch upon um, wh what kind of technologies have you been using or are planning on using um you know for again you know increasing employee engagement um more frequent communications with employees to um um you know i i think it's going to play a big major role and my question is uh just a two parts one is what kind of technologies do you see that's going to change the way we operate as a business and uh, do you see any um uh, a, a significant uptick in using some of the technologies in the AI, artificial intelligence, or machine learning space. I, I'll start with Donna. I know I'm sorry it's a big question, but you know, try your best. <laughs> Listen, I'm just going to have a short couple of of statements because I really want to hear from the other two because they're really in it right now. Uh, you know, what I obviously would say is video conferencing clearly is right. I think something that's going to stay with every organization that is now implemented. Limited it. Um, I think you'll have riots in the streets from a lot of employees if they are not given some flexibility to work from home, um, particularly if they don't feel safe. Um, or I, I, I cannot wait to start hearing the conversations when CEOs or leadership says, you know, you got to come back. We got to see you. You know, there's no way you can do your job unless you're here. I can't wait to hear the people go, oh, you've got to be kidding me, right? Because you guys know, Hatal and Diva, you know that that's going to happen. Um, but I do think a vast majority of companies are going to say, this actually works better. We might have been afraid to, to allow that much flexibility because we did think we needed to keep people here to engage, not for bad reasons, not for control, but for engagement. Ah, but now necessity is the mother of invention. We now know that we had to let people work from home. We see that it can work. We're going to lean into it. So definitely these types of uh, remote video conferencing tools, are they're here they're here to stay and yes people probably too bad we didn't buy a lot of stock in zoom a little while ago <laughs> um and, and i also think again and you're seeing just an uptick in, in any kind of group messaging um you're you know microsoft teams you're seeing facebook products um i also think you're gonna see and, and these were here before but i i also think uh instant messaging platforms oh like slack and yeah, don't quote me on this but i think their their sales have been like as well um, all of us are used to remote types of working. So a Slack or a Zoom, that's been part of our, our technology stack for years. But I forget how this has now exploded to so many organizations that weren't using these things. So um, I'm going to stick with the obvious. Uh, these are the types of tools right now that I think are here to stay for sure. And then I'm going to throw it to the other ladies about some other probably more HR specific types of things that will be in play. Thanks, Tom. Um, Divya, come back to your same question. Um, what do you see the the technologies that's going to change the way you know the HR and the management teams that operate and and um, do you see any um, uptick in engaging AI and machine learning algorithms play in? Yeah, so um, in my case, uh, technology has been a lifesaver. Um, Technology has changed an HR leader's life to a great extent. So uh, be technology in hiring, technology in workforce management, technology in r and R, you know, have all contributed in bringing our paradigm shift. So, um, so for example, in our case, uh, in CPAL's case, the e-boarding feature in Talent Hire came as a blessing, wherein we could, you know, onboard a lot of new joinees during the lockdown period without any hassles. You know, we also uh, hosted our quarterly uh, r and through a webinar. Uh, we keep doing our engagement activities through uh, WhatsApp. Uh, we also make uh, use of, you know, go to meetings. So yeah, all these things are there to stay. Um, my only uh, two cents here would be that, you know, all organizations uh, should keep one thing in mind and that is to not overwhelm the employees the technology uh, but they should choose the right software the right tools that best suit their organization yeah yeah here here that's right right there <laughs> thanks you. Uh, great great insights um um 
um, Hital, you run a business um, in as part of that as also HR. And how, how are you uh, trying to keep engaged your internal staff, your employees, the consultants, um, your customers, and what are the tools? And, um, and have you seen any uptick and using any of the AI machine learning and you know, try, what, what, what's, I would like to hear from you. I mean, you know, I have some perspectives we'd love to share. No, absolutely. Thank you for asking that question. And uh, uh, I think Don and Divya touched upon some real incredible points there. What I will say is technology is definitely an enabler, right? Um, for many generations, it's really, especially uh, this is a women's forum, so I'm going to really touch upon the women. It has increased and created more opportunities for us to be able to have career paths, uh, uh, career development opportunities, being able to be in leadership roles, certain roles that in the past, at times, was not easily accessible and built. And with that, what we at Rangam are really uh, passionate about is diversity and disability hiring initiatives, right? So we focus a lot in that, and that's one of our niche areas on making a, that connection of the job seekers that are highly skilled, talented individuals with corporate opportunities and really figuring out how we can increase those opportunities and reducing the number of percentage of unemployment. So oftentimes we'll see one out of five people uh, that we know in, the, uh, in our, in our uh, community has either visible or invisible disability. And almost only 30% of them are employed. And this is a statistics post pre pre COVID. Amidst COVID, can't even imagine what that number must look like. And post COVID as well. But what I will say is our experience in this area, because of technology and how technology has advanced and evolved, uh, the usage of Zoom activities, Microsoft Teams with the transcribed capabilities. It's really increased uh, 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 and created a level play field for many of us with different abilities, different availabilities, different uh, skills, different talent. Uh, so, Samir, to, to answer your question, yes, AI is getting incorporated and automation is always going to happen. Uh, and oftentimes we do experience, we see that innovation, it takes sometimes a long time to adopt. Um, some new creative, innovative um, productions, innovation that happens in our industry. And within the staffing industry, we see technology being leveraged quite a lot. And post-COVID, what, COVID, what I anticipate seeing is really how do we, uh, how do we really focus more on treating talent like a human and not a commodity? So, Technology and AI, what that's really going to do is enable our organizations that focus a lot on helping people get back to work, especially for the COVID, that's one of our focus area. How do we help all of our workers, all of, of, all of the talent, amazing talent, get back to work? These mandated tasks that's involved in this process will be automated. AI is going to assist us in that area and allowing us to focus more on individuals' ability, understanding what are their passion areas, what is their dream career, and helping them to move along do it for those particular positions and creating opportunities for them. And being a true career advisor and advocate, true career advisors for the, for the talent and providing a uh, consultative approach to our customers to help them to understand and learn where do these skills exist and how to identify them, how to bring them on board, how to connect with them. So for our customers, the biggest thing on the mind today is cost savings, right? We always hear a lot about how can we reduce the rates? How can we, um, you know, uh, save, save, uh, save cost? Well, if there's going to be efficiency within the process, you're automatically going to have cost savings in that area. You're going to have reduced turnover. You're going to have increased productivity. You're going to have a more engaged um, employee base, more diverse workforce that brings in different perspectives. 
brings in innovation. And that's what we're all about today. Innovation uh, through COVID, what we're experiencing is, is actually a fast, accelerated mode. We're innovating every single day. Each and every one of us, uh, our uh, mindsets have really transformed and changed. And it's not like the way it was before uh, uh, pre-COVID. So um, that's what, you know, what I will share with you, that technology is definitely going to uh, evolve. Auto uh, automation is going to be there, but it's going to be for the good. Thanks. Um, thanks, Hital. Um, I just want to add a, two quick pointers to all of the great pointers you've already added. One thing, you know, I just um, um, was in uh, discussions with um, some of the tech forums in the in the recent times. They're talking about um, using AI, machine learning in in doing the people analytics. You know, is this a good hire? Is this a right hire? You may you know the, the 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 candidates may have enough skills but do they have a fitment skills do they have a fit because now we're doing more and more remote how do we because we're not interviewing in person a lot of uh, people are actually onboarding uh, interviewing remotely but how do we ensure that so i i think they're trying to fill some of those um, missing physical connection with uh, um, with the technology analysis the people analytics platforms and stuff it's an interesting which gained a lot of momentum in the last couple of months. Um, though these technologies exist uh, for quite some time, that people haven't seen that much need. Hey, you know what? I'll bring someone in person for an interview now. They can do it, and there I think you know. So things have changed definitely, and the technology is playing a big role. And thank you for sharing all of your insights. I'm actually trying to make a completely U-turn here because you you have an amazing experience. You build careers out of this, and I have. We have. We talk about 64 percent, 62 percent of our participants are uh, women. They are starting their early careers, their mid careers, um, entrepreneurs, and uh, and want to be preneurs, right? Um, they they want to be uh, become entrepreneurs. So they are all. We all would love to hear from you. Um, I'll start with Don. What do you see the greatest strength of female leaders? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I've changed this. Um, what advice do you have for women starting their career? What are, advice do you have for women in leadership positions like yours? Um, I think a better way for me to frame this would be what was some of the, some of the challenges I had? What are the, the hard lessons that I learned? Um, I think the biggest obstacle I had in my leadership career and I'm going to do a level set here. First of all, women, men, whomever, if you want to advance in your career, you've got to work hard. All right, so let's just put that out there. You got to work hard. You got to want to constantly learn. You want to uh, be able to own your faults and, and you want to be able to, to produce. These are things you must do. All right, there, mm -hmm. the level set is there. There's the disclaimer. All right, so now when we talk about though me being a female, uh, the biggest obstacle I had in my career was myself my own self-doubt. It wasn't even conscious. It was who I was. Uh, imposter syndrome. Um, not sure why they would want to pick me to do something. Then I'd have to go, now when I look back, I was like, what a bunch, what a waste, wasted amount of mental energy. Um, always thinking about, well, why me? As opposed to, well, well why not me? Um, I think that a lot of women in the research I've done and folks that I've talked with, uh, women leaders, they've struggled with the same thing. This coming into a space already mentally feeling, they're sh they only mentally have shrunken themselves down because they're just glad to be there. Even if the male counterparts have done nothing to make them feel that they're not welcome. All right? <laughs> yeah. Now rest assured there are male counterparts and female counterparts that sometimes don't want you there. That's a whole nother bottle of wine conversation, right? But I think when I look, really, when I look at my, my career, and I think I was my biggest obstacle. Um, and, uh, and I'll give you a, a brief example of when I finally realized um, that, oh, Dawn, you gotta, you gotta change this. And it was a little too late. Um, when I started at one organization I was at, and it was in an executive leadership role, I really was, this was the first time I had been in an executive leadership role. So. I was just so glad that oh, thank you. I was, I was very much in, and I believe this is still good. Uh, I, I want to learn, you know, before I start, you know, telling my thoughts and how things should be done. I, I need to learn, and 
you know, I'm going to listen more and talk less, all that's good to a point. Again, we're talking about if you're already in the role. And um, I, I had way too long of a ramp up period of me being in the, I'm going to listen and learn mode um, until then it was almost too late because then I realized, wait, I don't know if I'm being as heard as much in this particular role. I'm respected, but I'm not heard. And I said, wow, a new VP of sales just got hired. And from day one, he came in and was like, here's what I think. And this is what we should do. And da, 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 da. And he was very cogent and smart. And he, you know, he wasn't like a blowhard, but he, day one, he didn't go through the whole, I need to listen and learn more and, and kind of get my feet. No, he came in like, boom. And uh, so I remember I, I said to myself, okay, next meeting, because I'd already been in the organization for a while now. Next meeting, I'm going to do like he did. Yeah. Oh, I'm coming in, baby. Not guns hot, but I'm going to be, hey, this is what we should do. Da, 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 da. Well, guess what? It went over like a lead balloon because <laughs> my CEO wasn't used to me being like that. My CEO could not envision me doing the same thing that the male counterpart had already established from day one. So I could go on with many, many more stories, but that was a big lesson for me because I'm the one that created that dynamic not my CEO, not the other people. So I think a lot of it is just, um, I think it happens more with women than men. And I think that'd just be my, 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 my little story there just to say, just don't have so much self-doubt. Go into it strong. You're there for a reason. No, thank you so much. This is great. Why not me, right? Why not me Why not keep me? asking these questions? Thank you so much. That's great. And the way I want to come back to you, um, what advice do you give uh, to the woman uh, who's uh, just get, getting entry into their um, careers or the mid careers to the um, in the senior senior leadership positions? Um, all right, okay. So uh, my suggestion to all youngsters, uh, irrespective of gender, would be to you know first of all understand your strengths and choose a profession accordingly. Uh, you got to look for opportunities and not money because good opportunities will create money and let gender not be a barrier in following your passion. So this would be my advice to youngsters. Um, my advice to women leaders will be, you know, to keep giving their best at work without any guilt. It is okay if you have to leave your kids at daycare. It's okay if you have to order food from outside. So what? So uh, do not try and be a superwoman. It's okay if your house is unkept. So, um, you know, uh, your career is as important as anybody else's. So you got to take charge of it. Um, and yeah, one more thing. Don't be scared of judgments and do not let these judge judgments uh, pull you down. Yeah, Sami, that's my... What, what a great motivation. What an ounce of motivation for all of us. Thanks, Divya. Um, Hidal, I would love to hear from you too. Um, you know, you are an entrepreneur. You build business from ground up. And um, uh, what advice would you give it to um, youngsters and mid and executive uh, people in the organization? Um, would love to hear your insights and, and maybe some path, maybe some silver bullet for us. So I can tell you a story. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the key factors have already been touched upon. But personally, my experience has been a little bit of a, uh, almost like a roller coaster, where growing up, um, so there, there's a story that goes, you know, there's uh, like a Pomorian, they're like those little small dogs, and they think when they come in front of you or in front of a big dog, they think they're that big, mighty dog, right? They don't realize the size, but the confidence that they have in them, that power that they feel that they can do anything. That's what we can all, you know, instill in ourselves. Be that strong person, be confident. Um, so in my career path uh, growing up, uh, I, I don't think I ever felt that there was anything that limited me because I was a woman. Um, I, was, I, I was in engineering school. Oftentimes, I was the only woman in the class, uh, surrounded by uh, all male, and I never, it, it never occurred to me uh, that I'm the only one. So I felt like that little Pomeranian where you just don't see yourself any different, right? Um, so, however, but when you get into the real world, things are a little bit different. And 
as women, our, our basic nature is nurturing, empathetic. Uh, we strive to be the best and we hold ourselves responsible for everything. And we think that we have to solve everybody's problems and we have to be the perfect person, that perfect mother, that perfect wife, that perfect boss, perfect leader, perfect colleague, perfect friend. Um, so guess what? Uh, you don't have to be that. And that's what I'm going to share with you. It's okay to fail. Um, and it's okay to allow others to pick you up. Uh, and that's been uh, my experience where I've been surrounded by some amazing individuals, including uh, friends, uh, coworkers, teammates, uh, some of the, uh, I would say in the industry, I've had some amazing mentors. So surround yourself with people who are your well-wishers, who's going to inspire you, who's going to motivate you, who's going to push you above and beyond what you think you're capable of. Um, and then, again, most important thing that I think Divya mentioned is follow your passion. Follow your passion and the dream and don't let anything limit yourself. Thank you, Hital. You know, I'm, I, I this is a, I hope this is not a controversial question, but I'm going to ask it either way. I think it's, it's um, I would love to hear from your perspective. Um, you know, we have seen uh, during the, the the whole crisis and pandemic and the COVID-19 situations, uh, you know, you know, the countries led by women leaders are way, way better than the counterparts, the men leaders. And there may be some reason for, I really don't know. We are looking at Germany, looking at um, Iceland and many other countries. So what, I mean, I'm starting with Don. Um, what are the major <laughs> differences between men and uh, between male and female leaderships? And why uh, are female leaderships, and especially across we have seen, are, are, are better and more progressive? And I would love to hear your comments. Oh, I'm nervous. So, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of shooting from the hip here. I wish I had like some empirical data to to say why. You know, I will say um, there are as many different uh, female leadership styles as there are men. You know, I don't necessarily think I I definitely don't think one is better than the other. There's so many components that. Uh, you know, internal, external, uh, things that are within your control, outside of your control that make up how you lead. But I do think that uh, Hattel already, if we're gonna talk stereotypically or what tends to be a big differentiator between men leaders and female leaders is I think the DNA of the, the, the nurturing, that, that DNA chip of empathy and nurturing. Um, so I, I, I think that in most cases that is a big, big pro, all right, most cases. And I think possibly in these situations here with COVID, um, some of those female leaders probably got ahead of the politics of everything and said, no, we got to go into the safety mode. Let's do it. Let's do X, Y, Z. And I'm saying that half educated because I don't know exactly what all of them did. I know that they got big press on doing the right things, correct, but I don't know what they did. So there we go. So um, that said, you also have to. Um, I think women also though, and if you read any of my stuff, guys, I'm big on the empathy trust thing. Totally, that is changes the world for leadership of any, any gender. Um, the thing though is that you have to be able to understand um, the role empathy plays in building trust so you get results because you can be the most empathetic person in the world. But if you're not able to still um, harness that empathy as something to help you make decisions, inspire people, get results, then you can just become a pushover. It's very difficult to then kind of put a line in the sand and then move forward with, now that I've heard people from an empathetic point of view, how do I then now move forward in taking a stand in leading a movement and in um, communicating a message that incorporates the why, which is usually based on listening and empathy. So, I've gone around the world here. I went above and beyond your question. 
Um, um, but but that's that's just my initial thoughts uh, regarding the, the main differentiator between women and men leaders. Thanks, Donna. I and, and I I've, I've read a few articles on you know you're definitely a champion of empathy. There are a lot of things that. Um, uh, um, you know, Satya Nadella, the, the current CEO of Microsoft, talks about uh, how empathy changed its organization to the current Absolutely. form. It's not yeah. so much of, uh, you know, the, the style and the policies, but really how he drove the organization on basis of the basic principles of empathy. It changes so much. You know, he increased the market cap three times of the uh, the Microsoft in the last five years. It's so powerful. Thank you so much for that. And what we're seeing now, like with Facebook, for instance, a lot of people right now, although there's some cool stuff that Zuckerberg has done in the crisis, like they're starting to say people, we're going to hire people from anywhere now, a lot more with remote. But right now, he is the perception that he has a lack of an empathy chip. Uh, with his employees regarding um, his ability to communicate his stances on uh, monitoring violent posts. Yeah. And people are starting to quit. So that's where you go. There has to be this balance between empathy and business sense. Right. Um, but typically the ones who are who have the business sense, the vision, the drive, but are listening with an empathetic spirit to make better decisions, they usually are the ones that are going to succeed, usually. More to come on Zuckerberg. We'll see what happens there, especially here in the States with everything happening here. Right, thank you. Thanks so much. Divya, um, yeah. and what's your perspective on the male and female leadership? Um, and um, what, what, what do you see that um, the difference? All right, so that's a very, um interesting question and you know i would um, uh, i would want to believe that you know women naturally are good listeners you know and so they tend to understand the wants and needs of the employees better uh, they have a higher eq which makes them more empathetic leaders um, also women leaders are more collaborative and are proven to be more ethical and honest so this there was a survey that was done by gallup and it was found that you know uh, women leaders were found to be you know more ethical and honest, and therefore the trust index was higher. Um, so what I believe is that you know uh, people are your real assets, and you must win over them with love and understanding to get the best out of them. Uh, so once employees realize that their leader is one of them and understands them then they will be more than willing to align with their leaders uh, goals and mission yeah so that is all i have to say from you thank you i mean i i'm taking away um, the good leaders good listeners high um, empathy um and uh, and I I remember um, the G Gallup post talking about um, ethics and harness uh, index uh, is high on it. Thanks, Dewey. Yeah. Uh, I'm come back to you. Um, um, you know, you you um, build a business, and I'm 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 sure you work with many many male colleagues and and uh, counterparts in the industry. What have you seen? And and also I do know. Uh, we have some of the largest and the biggest staffing forums led by women um, in uh, in the United States, at least. Uh, so what have you seen um, the change of leadership styles between men and women? So, I mean, in that area, my, I have a different perspective. Uh, and I think Don also touched upon that as well as Divya, is that for every organization, there's different mixes of leadership style and skills that are definitely required. Uh, no one uh, type of leadership style, um, I would say, outweighs the other or defines the success or measures uh, the performance of the organization. However, um, there are uh, each individual holds a different type of personality. And as women, oftentimes we are uh, by nature very empathetic and, and nurturing um, in nature. So we often uh, lead by examples. We share stories to motivate people. Uh, our own personal stories will share our own thought point of view, and we'll ask them what are their thoughts, what did they think. Mm -hmm. uh, getting that buy-in from them, I think that oftentimes really is, becomes the, a little bit of a differentiator uh, in, in, for women leaders as when they're leading some of their, their organizations. 
and that level of um, tactical as well as I would say um, the, uh, the the process of the results in our brains and our minds. I think we go through that methodological process that we can see each step of the frameworks, what should happen, what should not happen for, for the type of results that we're looking for. Um, that does definitely drive the way we often lead our team and, and, and our organizations. Thank you, Hida. That's, uh, that's a great. And um, I know for all the success, as we all mentioned, Don um, and Hita, you and Divya talk about, I think it's a, it's a combination of uh, um, the leadership styles that um, it's not just the one or the other, one better than the other. Um, it, it's, a, it's a collaborative um, common goal approach in the leadership. I think it wins the businesses and wins the people's personality. Um, we have um, spent almost an hour. I think it just went by you know, in a second. So wow. I want to thank you for all of your time. Um, and uh, I think we will learn a lot. One, what, what we generally do is uh, post of this event, we kind of collect uh, the the thoughts and insights you provided. We kind of uh, write up a small, um, um, you know, write up on it. We send it to you if you are good with it. We're allowed to publish that because I'm sure there are a lot of people out there haven't able to join the call would, uh, you know, benefit out of this. So, um, and we will um, get back to you on that as well. But until then, thank you so much uh, for all of your time. And I pass it on to uh, Sheila, um, and Sheila, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that panel discussion, Don, Divya, and Hetel. Really great. Thank you so much. Um, as a young woman, I'm really grateful for your insights. So we're going to do an abbreviated Q&A. We just have a couple questions. This won't take more than you know five minutes. But our first question is for Don specifically. And we wanted to know, how do you think HR is going to emerge or evolve with everything that's happening in COVID? So as a consultant and a speaker and a writer, what are your thoughts on the evolution of HR departments? Yeah, um, well, I, I think that we've started to see this evolution slowly over the last decade, um, but I think now it's gonna be fast-tracked. Um, HR's true mission, I think, is to be connectors. HR's true, true mission is to help people understand their, their purpose um, and how to connect the dots uh, to help people understand what their role is in getting business results. That is the mission of the HR Pro as opposed to being a policy policeman. Um, and I think COVID is fast tracking this need of a central uh, department within a corporation who um, is expert in connection, in facilitation, in weighing pros and cons, in being able to teach trust and vulnerability and empathy. Um, and that's not soft skills anymore. That's that's the thing that a lot of people think, you know, hey, that's all soft and fluffy. No, it is a business imperative now. Um, I would love it if HR folks got out of employee relations. I mean, I, I in some ways wish that. That's again, oh, we have so many now follow up wine dates to talk about things here. But I do believe that um, it's difficult to be a connector when you're also seen as the police and the enforcer. Um, but I do believe that what we are gonna just see is a continually, a continuing evolving function that's getting um, more into the connector space and less out of the policing space. And that's mm -hmm. gonna get better results right now. That's great. Divya and Hetel, do you guys have anything to add to that question or? No, I think Dawn's really wrapped it up really nicely. Okay, Putting that great. human touch, yes. Um, so our next question is, how do you think HR leaders should transition to a back to work approach? And what strategies do you think are essential as we move to opening back up? So I, if you like, I can touch upon that a little bit. Returning back to work is going to happen in phases and transition. Um, I think we're, there's a lot that's going to be uh, need to be considered in this area. Uh, first uh, and foremost, really knowing your employee base, what are their expectations, what are their needs, and safety. Safety is one of the top most things uh, every organization is going to need to 
uh, look into to ensure uh, is there a facility does it does it have the the social distancing guidelines and the rules um, are you providing them with all the different types of support um, for uh, do you have to technology or do you have a system in place for contact tracing something that way that we hear about a lot to learn if a, if something transpire how are you going to address some of those area communications to the to the employees and those that are working at home some of the things that we're all going to need to think about is the working environment how is the working environment is it safe uh, or through ergonomics point of view do they have the proper facility proper um, devices proper furniture if they're going to work long term from home those are some of the responsibilities as an organization we will need to start looking into, which is something that we didn't really consider in the past. That's great, thank you. Um, so this is our last question for today and then we'll wrap up. Um, again, thank you all for joining us. But so our last question is, obviously this has been a really hard time for everyone and employees are being furloughed and even laid off. So how do you think that HR leaders can balance the demands of employees with employers and to put that question another way, how can we bridge the gap between what's necessary for business and having this human touch we've been emphasizing all webinar? Girl, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question. I, I, I am diverting it to one of the other panelists. So go ahead, Sylvia, then I can definitely share some viewpoints of mine. So if I've got the question right, so um, are you trying to ask as in how are we going to track talent or uh, what is it? Yeah, so, so I think the, the overall thrust of the question is there are a lot of demands for businesses right now to stay afloat with COVID-19 and in, you know the contracting economy. But we also want our HR departments to reach out to our employees with this kind of human touch. And how are we going to strike this balance between what business dictates and what as HR representatives we should really be striving for? All right. Uh, so what I think is that this point in time, uh, employee health and well-being has become an HR leader's priority. So as uh, Hethel said earlier that, you know, if we are planning to get back to work, we need to make sure that, you know, our, uh, you know, the, the premises, the office premises, um, the workstations are all clean, hygienic. We provide all the necessary, uh, you know, hygienic um, equipments to our people. Um, and also at the same time, uh, I understand that you know it's the economy has uh, gone down drastically and you know uh, we need to uh, keep up with the pace uh, but um, at the same time um, as i said um, employee well-being will be uh, my focus as an hr leader for now yeah i i think during this time uh to bridge that gap you you have to get clear on two things that must happen um, during times like this where people really don't feel in control, whether you're a leader or employer in HR pro, because we don't know what's going to happen next, is a time where you have to um, create feedback programs, ways to hear people, ways to connect with people, ways to alleviate fears, ways to get feedback from how do we solve some problems. And then once you've gotten all that feedback, then you make decisions. And you need to execute those decisions clearly, calmly, and make sure everybody is on the same page on why a decision has been made. Now, I think the first step, though, is very important uh, because um, if you don't have ways to then have people be heard about the things, their fears, their ideas, their solves, things they want to test, and you just come out with a plan of what we're going to do, um, it, then it can feel a little dictatory. Um, so that's where you have to find that fine balance um, and that's where I think the two the two worlds merge with let's get feedback let's hear thoughts let's do that and then we've got to make an educated decision on what we need to do to keep the business forward where everybody's safe healthy and sustainable Definitely. that's great um, I think that's all we have time for today so again to our panelists thank you so much Samir thank you for moderating um, for all of our attendees, this webinar will be released in a follow-up email um, along with a summary. 
So thank you all for attending. Stay safe and see you next week. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.